Dear Lord, we thank you for the life that you've given us once again, able to see, able to think and move and be able to hear and all the things that you allowed us to uh, be able to do. Thank you for your word. We thank you for your truth. We thank you for giving us a mind to serve you, a heart to serve you. We thank you for the grace that you've given us and the mercy. We know that this time that we're living in is a perilous time. Evil is raising, it's, it's, it's rising higher and more wicked than ever before. But we know that in the midst of all this, you're still faithful. You still give us truth in your word. You give us guidance through your Holy Spirit. We know that when we humble ourselves, that you will keep us and uplift us and sustain us. We give you the glory and the honor. In your name, Yeshua, we pray. Amen. So imagine, if you will, you are standing in front of two doors. The door on your left, door number one, it's open. You can see clearly in there. And I tell you that what you're looking at is complete, utter turmoil. It's suffering. It's agony. It's fire and brimstone. It is no break. It is no... Uh, relaxation time. There's no time out. It's just continuous, ongoing, forever. Pain and agony. Desires, wants, needs, never met. Just continual suffering forever. And then on your right, door number two, there is the complete opposite. Complete peace, harmony, joy, no feeling of having not enough, no lack, no sickness, no type of suffering at all. Constant, continuous, just great, um, uh, wonderful feelings of, of, of serenity. And I tell you, you have 10 seconds to choose which door you want to go into. And once you go in, you can't come back. We all will probably choose the door on the right, heaven, peace, joy, happiness, no more tears, no more sorrows, no more pain, forever and ever a time of just wonderful life. You would have to be either possessed or insane to want to go through door number one. Our natural instinct, our natural feelings, our natural makeup is really, yes, let me get in door Number two, now, it wouldn't even take you 10 seconds to decide what door you want to go into. Before I finish talking, you've already shot through door number two. But the question remains, why do we want to go through door number two? Is it to avoid the suffering and agony, to, to not go through the eternity of, of tremendous pain? Is that why we, we flee these areas? These, these, this, this place of just unimaginable suffering forever. You know, when I was uh, training my students today, um, like junior high school, um, some, some high school, some elementary kids, and, you know, we were in a circle and they were doing planks and uh, leg raises for about 30 minutes. That was pretty much all we did. And while they were training, I asked them to name their favorite video games. I said, name those games that you guys like. And each one of them named their games. And as they were naming them, I was looking up on my phone just to kind of see what type of video game it was. Some of them I knew what they were. Other ones I had to look up to confirm that these were the games they played. And when I was done talking to them, I asked them, did anybody read their Bible today? And they pretty much said no. They all have a Bible, but none of them read it. And I asked them, why not? Did you play your video games today? And they said, yeah. I said, do you guys like wickedness, evil, sorcery, worshiping Satan, living uh, uh, in, in demonic spirits? And they said, no, absolutely not. Why would we want to do anything, that kind of stuff? 
I said, do you believe in Jesus Christ? And they all said, yes. Do you love him? Do you want to go to heaven? They said, yes. So then I asked them, I said, if I went over to the store, there's a Publix grocery store right next to our facility. And I asked them if I went over there and bought you your favorite sweets, your favorite cake, would you, would you, would you want me to get it for you? And they said, absolutely. I said, would you eat it right now if I gave it to you? And they said, of course, we'll take it. And I had them name every one of their sweets. I said, name your favorite pie or favorite cookie or something you enjoy. Most of them had a favorite one. Other ones were just like, you know what? If it's sweet, I'll eat it. And I told them, they said, they said, they told me, they said, I would eat it right now. I said, but what if I told you before you ate it that it was a little bit, just a little, not much, a little hair of dog poop in your favorite sweet, would you eat it? They all were like, oh, no, absolutely not. That is ugh, disgusting. Why would I do something like that? Why would I eat? I said, just a little bit. I mean, if I give you a whole quarter ice cream and I just put a little drop of dog poop, would you eat it? And they said, no, absolutely not. And I said, well, if you wouldn't tolerate a single piece of dog poop in your favorite sweets, why would you tolerate just a little bit of sin in your life. And you should have seen it was complete silence. And we went on and I, and, I, and I told them that these things that you do, how can you say that you love God? You believe in him. You believe in his son, the Christ, Jesus. But you tolerate wickedness. You tolerate sin. And after that, they, 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 you can tell the lights came on in a way that... Some of them probably never came on before. And the reason why I asked them this is because I had this thought came to me today. Why do we tolerate sin? Why do we settle for things that we were told in the scripture not to do? And the reason being is because this is what Isaiah told Jerusalem in Isaiah 29. He said, in so much as these people draw near with their mouths and honor me with their lips, but have removed their hearts far from me. This is what he says to the, uh, the people of God who rejected or refused to do his commandments. He said, uh, and, and their fear towards me is taught by the commandments of men. You know, I was asking the Holy Spirit what to say today because I was, I had all kind of issues at problems. I was running all over the place, you know, and I knew, I knew, oh, God wanted a word to come forth. And that's why every time it's something that he wants me to say, the spirit of God wants me to make known, there's always some rigmarole. The enemy throws my way. And this word here should be a wake up call for every one of us who say we believe. Because if we ever taught about holiness or righteousness, or we've heard the fire and brimstone preaching, We've got to a, we've probably gotten to a place where, you know what, let me figure out the things I need to do so I don't have to go to hell. So I don't have to spend eternity in the lake of fire with Satan. But at the end of the day, Jesus Christ says the same thing when he's talking to the Pharisees. He, re, he repeats it. He said the prophecy of Isaiah is true. You worship me with your mouth and your hearts are far from me. And that is where we're at in a lot of us who say we believe in Jesus Christ. We are, we've learned to walk in this holy way. We've, we've caught on to the checks and balances of showing up for church and paying tithes and saying our prayers. But our hearts at the end of the day are not for God. It's evident because we are living as we should. We, we are still tied to our favorite games and movies and sporting events and all these different things that we try to find some type of pleasure in. Our, our, our Netflix channels, whatever the case may be, alcohol, pornography, whatever it is. And, and we say in the, the day, you know, the commandment that we've been given, as you talked about in, in Jude 4.1, is that that grace it came in by some slick, lying preachers, teachers, 
and 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 and, and now it tells us that all we have to do is just believe in the Messiah, and we're saved, and we can you know obviously live as we choose. And hey, we all fall short of the glory of God. The commandments that we learn about righteousness, about holiness, is not in the scriptures. The Bible tells us that we are to lay aside every every sin and weight. That so easily beset us. Not the ones that we think we can manage or the ones that don't seem to be so bad. He said every single one of them. When I was done talking to these kids, I asked them if they had any questions. And one of them said, you know, what does it really mean to worship the devil? And I said, if it's wicked and if it is a thing we put before God. And he was one of the young men that had uh, played one of these video games that was obvious sorcery in it. it. Had all these different spells and magic and all this stuff in it. And he, you can tell there was a conviction that went on inside of him, the look that he had. And, you know, I told him, look, I'm not your parent. I can't make you change how you live or stop you from watching stuff. But you are not an age of accountability. You are responsible for your soul. Your parent can't pray you into heaven. They cannot pray you out of hell. You have to walk according to the word of God or else, as John said, we are a liar. If we don't practice the truth, if we don't keep the commandments of God, then we are a liar. The first commandment in the Bible is that we are to love the Lord our God with all our heart, mind and soul. There's not in one of those commandments does it say, do what I say so you don't go to hell. It says, love him. But we've been hoodwinked into believing that that means that we do these rituals, these routines of showing up for different ministry groups or services and certain prayers and all these other kind of things. But when we're not doing that, we find ourselves walking Contrary to the word of God, Jesus Christ, Yeshua, the Messiah said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Well, the first commandment is to love the Lord, our God, Yah, with all our mind, heart and our soul. And as I may mention before, there's so many opportunities for us not to do that. We don't live in the time when the New, the Old Testament scriptures was provided or when Christ walked the earth and the disciples. They didn't have all the wonderful, amazing, appealing, attractive things that we have today. All these phones and gadgets and apps and movies and all these different things that are, that are pulling our attention in so many different directions. But what keeps us stable? It's, it's the question. It comes down to the question of why do we really want to go to heaven? Are we trying to avoid condemnation or do we really love God? Do we really love his son? Do we really love what he did for us on the cross? We, we should all know that someone who tells us they loves us, but then don't show that to us, calls us to question if they love us or not. Jesus Christ tells us that love goes beyond the words that come out of our mouth and our, and our routines that don't build us, that don't edify the body of Christ, that doesn't convict us. I was talking to a gentleman, a, a newfound brother in Christ here, and he was telling me he had this, this uh, I want to say Versace cologne or some expensive cologne that he had. And he did the research and found out how it's tied to satanic stuff. The people who made it, it has all this, the, the logo and all these different things were completely satanic. And he's in a phase now or he said he feels that there is the, the enemy is about to rise up in a way the world has never seen before. And he wants to make sure there is nothing that pulls his attention, his service, his heart from God. So he's cleaning house. He threw away the bottle and, and just all other kind of things that he said that he believes that. Uh, are causing him distractions that are pulling him away. We have to make that same commitment every single day. We need to cut things off, move things away, because we don't want to go to hell, but above all else, we love the Lord. 
we love God. We want to serve him completely. That's a, I mean, if you really sit back and think about it, if you take the time and you really start pondering that question, why we want to go to heaven, you, 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 you'll be amazed what you'll think about. Because when it came to me, I was like, why do I really want to go? Why am I putting all this stuff away? Why am I, why am I sacrificing these feelings to watch certain movies or do certain things, just hang out? We need to know inside why we want to go. And the, and the hope is that it's because we want to be with the Father for eternity. Only he weighs the heart of all human beings. Only he knows what's deep down inside of our hearts. And I will tell you, there is no way, and you cannot justify it through anywhere in the Bible, that a heart that is not all in for him will be in heaven. And the reason why is because God is a holy God. He is a righteous God. There is no wicked, any of that in him. So that means that we have a heart that's halfway, half stepping, partially in him. It can't be in his presence. It can't be before him. We see this in the ministry of the disciples. We see this in, in uh, Judas. He walked with Jesus, but his heart was for money. We see it with Peter. He walked with Jesus as well, but his heart was set on fear. And he sank while, while he was trying to walk on water. This is why, again, the spirit of God has to be, must be, the driving force in our walk with Christ. God knew that we could not love him without him. And this was proven all the way back in the Garden of Eden. As soon as God left the garden, here comes the serpent. And it was moments later, they fell. They disobeyed. God knew this. This is why he sent his spirit, the Holy Ghost. So that way, when we're walking this earth, and here comes the serpent, which is the serpent is everywhere now, all over the place in everything. We have the spirit of God to to not only help us discern how we should walk, but at the same time, enable us to walk according to the truth and not stumble around in lies, claiming we love God. But then at the end of the day, our heart is only set on, well, I just don't want to go to hell. When you look at Revelation, the revelation of Christ given to John, he named seven churches of Asia. And there were six out of the seven where Jesus Christ had an issue with the church, those churches. He didn't like some of the things that they were doing. And he told them to repent. He told him to turn. He, he wasn't writing to a king of a country. He wasn't writing to, he wasn't addressing uh, uh, some pagan group or some off the wall satanic. He was talking to the churches, meaning the body of Christ. And he said, repent. He said, turn. He said, watch. I heard a preacher say the other day, I was watching this, this gentleman and um, completely tell a lie to uh, he's a growing preacher on YouTube and he's telling lies and he's, he's, he's leading people astray. And he said that, you know, there are a couple of scriptures in Revelation that talked about names being blotted out of the book of life. One of them is Revelation 3, 5, where he tells the dead church, if you don't over, if you don't overcome, then your name, then you would run the risk of your name being redacted. And then there's the other one where if you take from the book of life or take from the rev, this revelation that he will take from, uh, he would take from you the, the book of life. And then he gives these, these off the wall lying excuses why he says this isn't applied to the church. This isn't applied to the body of Christ. And of course, people who don't study the Bible for themselves, they follow this universal Christianity of all grace, no obedience, believe what he was saying to be true. But when you look at the book of Revelation and he's talking to the churches, and he gives these details about being a dead church, a lukewarm church. After every single one, before he moves on to the next, it says, He who has an ear, let him hear 
what the Spirit says to the church is. He's not just addressing that a particular church. He's addressing how church people, the body of Christ, carry themselves. None of Most of us never even been to Asia. So why would this even be a part of us? The reason why is because it's we get to a place of being dead, lukewarm, and at the end of the day, just not doing what we're supposed to be doing. And this is, you have, we have to understand the truth about who Jesus Christ is talking to. So we don't get into this false idea that, well, that doesn't apply to me. When you look at the faithful church, the church in Philadelphia, Jesus makes a very, very profound statement to them because of their faithfulness. In Revelation 3 chapters, uh, Revelation chapter 3 verse 7, he says, these things says he who is holy, he who is true, he who has the key to David, he who opens and no one shuts, shuts and no one opens. Verse 8, I know your works. See, I have set a door before, an open door before you, and no one can shut it. Jesus Christ said, I know your works. He didn't say, I know your faith. He didn't say, I know your, your, your words. He said, I know your works. Our works is a representation of the word that came out of our mouth and the heart we have. And because their works were faithful, he said he has set before them an a open door. We all have to get to the place of being faithful, faithful to the, to the Savior, faithful to the Father, faithful to the Holy Spirit. And when we get to this place, we need to stay there. We can't be straddling the fence. We can't go back and forth. We can't have that, that mindset that, that, well, you know what? It looks like Jesus is taking too long to come. It's only a matter of time before the one world order rises and the Antichrist takes the center stage and gives a super miraculous deception to the world. Those who are straddling the fence are going to be sucked right in. Ask yourself, what did you do when everything calmed down after the 2020 pandemic? Did you stay in your prayer closet? Did you keep fasting? Were, were you humbling yourself? Were you repenting and turning from stuff? Or did you gradually slide back into that life? That was a wake up call for every one of us. There's going to come a, an event just like that, but there won't be no comeback. There won't be an opportunity to say, well, let me do it again, God. Let me try again. It won't be like that. God allowed it to happen so that we can wake up and, and decide for ourselves who we really want to serve. We want to be serving our fears or serving him as this God who's ready to send wrath down on the earth. So let me figure out what steps I got to take to get to heaven or, or acts I got to do to make sure I have this form of godliness. When our heart is for him, we overcome the world. When we set our affections on things above and not the things below, we overcome the world. There's a conviction that rises in us even before we do things. You know, I had to go to the line. I had to get in line today at the store. And uh, before I, I had to wait, to, you know, now today it's, it's forever to get to be able to talk to somebody because People are not working like they used to. But I waited and a, a young lady comes up and says, hey, can I help you? And I didn't realize there were two people before me. So the other gentleman that was helping another customer said, hey, they were first. And I, and I said, OK, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. And they said, are you sure? I said, absolutely. Go ahead. Go on. So, you know, I waited and, and, and it kind of pushed my time back a little bit. But I, you know, I, I had to respect that because they were before me. But then as I waited, standing there, waiting on someone to call, call me, the lady to call me next, a guy jumps in front of me. And my initial feeling was, oh, no, you, you done lost your mind. But before I started to act, the Holy Spirit said, humble yourself. And I did. I had a decision to make. Was I in the right? Absolutely. But was, would my decision be righteous? It would not be. The Holy Spirit will always be there to tell you 
go left, go right, slow down, go faster, move over a little bit. But we have to decide to not quench the Holy Spirit and obey so we can keep in line with the commandments of God to show that we are his children, that we are disciples of Christ. We are living in the world now where the enemy is going to do every single thing to get us to walk outside of God's will. That's his, that is his goal. That was what he did from the, the day he had his first interaction with men. But thankfully, truly thankfully, God sent his spirit so we can have the ability to actually not walk in a, in a way that is not pleasing to God. Again, this is, a, this is the season for mass deception. This is the season for people to fall further away, to harden their hearts because they don't want, we don't want to have the discipline to get off Stop watching stuff and get off these things that don't, you know, I don't want to hear that no more. I don't want to hear about repentance and holiness and righteousness. I want to hear my blessings coming, my miracles on the way, favor, glory. We want the prophet to come in and give a fresh word from heaven, completely missing the fact that God never blessed a single person that was disobedient. Paul writes in Ephesians 5, Verse 15, it says, see then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be unwise, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not be drunk on wine, in which, in, which is dispensation, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns, and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Yeshua the Christ. He says, walk circumspectly. And to walk circumspectly is, is walking with our hearts set on God, walking in a way that we're not going to be led. We see the enemy trying to wheel us in. But we're careful. We're walking with discretion. We know somebody's trying to pull us into a silly argument. We know the enemy wants us to argue about somebody cutting us off in line. We know that we got maybe a bill issue or financial problems and the enemy wants us to sit off in the corner somewhere depressed instead of getting on our knees and thanking God that our, our debts are paid, that our bills are taken care of, knowing that uh, he supplies all our needs. According to his riches in Christ Jesus, the enemy is after us. We have to understand that he is after he he doesn't like the light. He hates the light. He can't stand the light. He's here to kill, steal and destroy. And if we don't put on the whole armor and stay suited up walking in the truth. Then he's going to yank us or we're going to go ahead and hop on his train under the guise of grace and thinking it's going to be all right if I ride it for a little bit. It ain't going to be all right. And Jesus come back and we're asleep. And we're focused on something. We, our heart has been connected to something that he has no pleasure in. He's not pulling us up. We're not going to get raptured up. We're, we're going to be, you know, unfortunately left here to decide if we want to suffer the, the wrath of the Antichrist. And, and, and before he comes, the the Holy Spirit already made known to me. People will already have a heart to receive him. They will already be ready to open their arms up wide and bow their knee down to serve him. We need to be obedient in this season. We need to ask ourselves why we really want to be in heaven. And if it's because we love our father, we love his, the, the, his son, our savior, then our life should reflect that. We shouldn't be having this adulterous spirit that calls us to walk with Satan and then come on back over to Jesus Christ when, you know, maybe we need a blessing or we going through a sickness or we got an enemy or whatever the case may be. We need to have a commitment as the church, a bride being prepared for the groom. So I want to encourage us, stay in his will. We can't be lukewarm. We can't be dead. 
We have to be consistent. We have to be obedient. We have to, above all, humble ourselves. And when we do this, the Spirit of God will move in a way. Will clearly tell you, close your mouth. Don't say that. Step back. Go ahead and walk out the building. Get on your knees and pray. I'm, I know it. I almost said today, after all this stuff I was going through, I said, I almost said something about my my walk and my faith that's not consistent with the word of God and what's really not true because the enemy creates these theatrics. He puts on a show. He's a, He perfects this and he does it so well that you will look at the show and think that your faith is not worth anything, that you spent all this time doing stuff and has no results. You never really planted any seeds. You're not his child. He will have you look at the 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 stupid lie that Satan puts out there. He'll have you look at his lie and get you questioning, well, am I really God's child? So again, let's ask ourselves why we want to go to heaven. And let's let our answer be a truthful one, a consistent with the word, and let's walk as such. He's preparing a bride. He's preparing us. Don't think that adversity you're going through is for nothing. He, chast he chastises whom he loves because he wants you to be ready. And we got to take that chastisement and move on to the next level. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for your truth, for your word. Thank you for blessing us. Thank you for empowering us with your spirit. We know that you have called us to live holy and righteous. We know that the enemy is defeated. We will walk according to your truth because we love you. Not because we don't want to go to hell but because we love the fact that you sent your son to die on the cross for us so that we can walk in love, in truth, in holiness and righteousness because that is where our heart is. That is where our mind is and our soul. We thank you. We give you the glory and the honor. In your holy name, Yeshua, we pray. Amen.